Good evening and welcome to St. Lawrence University's online Laurentian Lecture Series. My name is Kim Hissong and I'm the Executive Director of Annual Giving and Laurentian Engagement here at St. Lawrence. And I will help to moderate tonight's lecture. I'd like to cover just a few uh, technical items before we get started. Um, we have uh, over 100 alumni, parents, and friends who RSVP'd for tonight's lecture. And during the webinar, um, all participants will be muted. And we'll have several opportunities during the lecture to pause and invite you to participate in a poll or to ask questions or make a comment. If you would like to ask a question, you will have the ability to virtually raise your hand using the hand icon in the navigation pane that you see at the top right of your screen. The icon is a small hand in blue towards the bottom of your navigation pane. You click it once to raise your hand and click it again to lower it. And when you're called on, um, we will unmute you and you'll have an opportunity to ask your question. Just a few tips about the audio for tonight's lecture. If you're using the audio through your computer, um, just know that you must have a built-in microphone or an external microphone in order to ask questions. Otherwise, you'll be able to hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. If you're using the audio through your telephone, uh, if you're using your phone speaker, in order for us to hear your question, you will likely need to take the speaker off during that time and use your handset. We recommend that during the presentation you minimize the navigation pane by using the orange arrow near the top to minimize the pane. And then if you need to maximize the pane to ask a question or to take a poll, then simply use the orange arrow to maximize it. So without any further delay, I'm pleased to introduce our lecturer for the evening, Dr. Peter Bailey. Dr. Bailey attended Kenyon College before receiving his BA from the New School College, New School of Social Research. The Johns Hopkins University Writing Seminars provided him with an MA, and his PhD in English is from the University of Southern California. Dr. Bailey is the author of Reading Stanley Elkin, 1985, The Reluctant Film Art of Woody Allen, 2000, and Rabbit Unredeemed, The Drama of Belief in John Updike's Fiction, 2006, as well as numerous articles on contemporary American literature and film. Tonight's lecture is entitled Midnight in Paris, Rome, and San Francisco, Woody Allen's latest film. So welcome, Dr. Bailey. Thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate that. Um, I thank you for attending uh, tonight's lecture. I, I should tell you that if Woody Allen were, a, um, were an alumnus of St. Lawrence University, he would make a point of not listening to this because he is not a big fan of listening to other people talking about his work and doesn't like to talk about it himself. So um, he wouldn't be with us, but we don't really need him because uh, I suspect we can go on without him. What, what I thought I'd start by doing is giving you a little bit of background about um, the films before the three that, that we're going to concentrate on tonight, which are um, uh, Midnight in Paris, uh, To Rome with Love, and um, Blue Jasmine, um, just just to see where Woody Allen was before Midnight in, in Paris, which in uh, a, a book of, of essays on Allen that I've co-edited recently, one of the writers called a game changer because it really did change um, not only the numbers of people who were going to his films, but also the... Uh, I, I think the enthusiasm that that, um, that people had for going to his films. So uh, I'll I'll start with a brief background on where he's been uh, before midnight in Paris. Then I think we'll do a brief just to just to see what your preferences are. Do a brief uh, poll of of five films of his. Which of those would you decide is your favorite? And then we'll dive into Midnight in Paris. Uh, if you do have questions at any time during the presentation, please uh, send them on and, and we can stop at any point. The questions are often more interesting than, than the presentation, at least or so I've found. Where had Woody Allen's film career taken him and us by fall 2010 when he began shooting Midnight in Paris? 
Of course, there was no critical unanimity about the quality of his previous four to five films, but it's safe to say that for many reviewers, the absence of humor from them was less regretted than the presence of existential sourness. Woody seemed tired of the whole thing, and the movies generated by that mood seemed consequently lacking in energy. Uh, Scoop 2007 uh, could be his last broad comedy. Uh, the last kept getting stifled by the fact that it was a, um, uh, by the, the Jack the Ripper murder plot and the fact that it, that it was a uh, comic murder mystery. Maybe those kind of went out with Nick and Nora Charles. It, it just, it seemed not to work and, and he had doubts about it in, in a way that he doesn't usually express doubts about his film. His films, uh, 2008 was Cassandra's Dream, which as far as I know never made it to a single movie theater. It seemed to show up on television and, and even those who know Woody Allen didn't even know it was out there. Uh, it aspired to tragedy but lacked um, characters capable of carrying that level of gravitas. Vicky Cristina Barcelona, a lot of people saw as a kind of comeback film. It's a stunningly beautiful movie that closes with the two title characters grimly transversing the, uh, traversing the Barcelona airport, their disconsolate expressions expressing all that need to be said about the psychic residuum of their would-be romantic summers. Um, then came Whatever Works in which the facile character reversals of the transplanted southerners at the ending do little to clear the viewer's mind's ear of Boris Yelnikov's incessant existential kvetching. And finally, whatever, uh, whatever works was followed by You Will Meet a Tall Dark Stranger with its unrelenting emphasis on the delusions the human need for love and companionship delivers us mortal fools into desperately embracing. OK, those were his. Uh, five most recent films before Midnight in Paris, and it's 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 really despicable the way that he can work on a film for a year, and I can write one sentence and dismiss it. Um, but um, I, I I think these responses are somewhat typical of of, uh, of reviewers thinking that these were certainly not up to uh, what Woody Allen used to be. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell us what Woody Allen used to be. We'll give you five films, and uh, you decide among those, if, if you've seen them, which, which would be your favorite. OK, so we've launched the poll. Um, if you've minimized your pain, please go ahead and maximize the pain. You should see the poll there. We'll give you just a minute to complete your responses, and then we will close the poll, and you'll see the results. OK, get your votes in, and we're getting ready to close the poll now, and you should see the results. And we'll share the poll results. Very interesting response, because it, it does suggest, I mean, obviously, Midnight in Paris was out two years ago in any hall, was out in 1976, I think. Um, so his, his career co covered so many years and so many films. I actually originally had 15 films, but the, the poll would only do five. So OK, we'll, we'll stick with five. But if you look at that list, it's very interesting that, that Midnight in Paris is at the top. I would have thought that, that well, that, that Annie Hall might be at the top, or Hannah and her sisters. Uh, the zero percent for husbands and wives is very interesting, because of course that's the film that that is associated with the breakup with uh, Mia Farrow and and all that mess in the tabloids. That that um, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's still in people's minds when they think of, of Woody Allen. It would be an interesting question to ask people. Is that is that still 
give that still a problem. But but uh, yeah, midnight in Paris uh, showing up forty five percent. That it, it's very interesting. I actually went to a theater in Boston where it was <laughs> it was actually sold out. And I and I really wanted to ask at the box office, could this be true? A Woody Allen movie is sold out? You have to be kidding me. But but actually that movie made the last I knew it made sixty three million dollars. And that by Woody Allen standards, that's incredible. So it was um yeah, well beyond. It seems to me um, uh, Blue Jasmine, eh, it's somewhere, it's still in, in some theaters, it's somewhere around 35 million, and that's, that's pretty good. But Midnight in Paris really, yeah, really knocked things. Just really, did, uh, it was a bit of a game changer for Alan. And, um, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reviewers, uh, wants to say why uh, Kenneth Turan was uh, of the LA Times didn't much like the five films that, that I described before. Might have said things more or less like what I said, but he did say this about um, uh, the Woody Allen's uh, 2011 film. You may know, you may not know that Woody Allen turns out one film a year, regardless of floods, anything. He's always got a new film coming out, and this was. His, his films are always called Alan 2011, Alan 2012. Uh, Alan 2011 was Midnight in Paris. Uh, this is Kenneth Turan. Woody Allen has made a wonderful new picture, Midnight in Paris, and it's his best, most enjoyable work in years. With Midnight in Paris, Turan continued. Alan has lightened up, allowed himself a treat, and in the process created a gift for us and him. His new film is simple and fable-like with a definite when you wish upon a star quality, but bolstered by appealing performers like Owen Wilson, Marion Cochillard, and uh, Rachel McAdams. It is his warmest, mellowest, and funniest venture in far too long. You can sense his continued passion for the city throughout the film, feel the extra pep in his step, and pleasure in his heart." Uh, end quote. This is a very different kind of review from what uh, Turan had been writing about Woody Allen films before this. And, and so I guess the obvious question is, where did the, the pep in his step and the uh, pleasure in his heart come from? Um, he explained in an interview with Eric Lax, who uh, interviewed him for lots and lots of hours uh, throughout the 20th and early 21st century. Uh, he was interviewed, not about the film, because the film hadn't been made yet, but, but he recalled being in Paris making uh, What's New Pussycat, 1965. I had, Alan said, or fancied myself having an artistic temperament, and I was plunged into Hollywood at its most venal. The redeeming thing about the film was that I got to spend eight months in Paris, and I developed a love for the city. I have a regret, or semi-regret that I didn't stay there. Two of the girls who did the costumes liked Paris so much they stayed there and lived there and worked there. I didn't have their independence or spirit or, or originality. It took a more adventurous soul than me to do it, and it's a shame." End quote. Consequently, we find Gil Pender, Owen Wilson, articulating the regret that he should have remained in Paris when he visited it for the first time. Quote, uh, we may be a couple of uh, a couple behind. There's the there's the poster for the movie, and there's the um, sorry, I thought it wasn't signaling properly. Uh, there's the the quotation from Kenneth Turan, and then uh, Alan told what it is that that Alan told Eric Lax, followed by what Gil Pender says. If I stayed here and had, sorry, written novels and not gotten caught up in the grind of Hollywood, I would have been better off, the, the uh, ellipsis suggests. I'm having trouble writing my novel because I'm a Hollywood hack who never gave literature a real try. If you've seen the movie, you see how, how down he is on Hollywood uh, when, when his um, future parents-in-law 
suggests that they went to some stupid American movie last night. Uh, he suggests that he probably not only saw it, he probably wrote it, has nothing but contempt for the kinds of, of films that, that he's working on, and therefore uh, he wished that, that he had stayed in, um, stayed in Paris to give literature a real try. He's come to Paris this second time with his fiancée, Inez, Rachel McAdams, and her parents, and it becomes immediately clear that Inez prefers the Hollywood hack, who turns out, to be, who turns out meaningless scripts that pay well and which will ultimately allow her and Gil to live in Malibu. If you've seen the movie, you know that she is not a sympathetic character, as lovely as she might be. Uh, what Gil needs to do in order to fortify himself to dump Inez and her American parents, crass American commercialism, is to convince himself that he has a literary future. And to do that, he recreates in the streets of Paris a literary coterie intent upon nothing more significant than saving him from his Hollywood embracing Inez pursuing self. No one in the film but Gill encounters Cole Porter, Ernest Hemingway, the Fitzgeralds, Gertrude Stein, Salvador Dali, and the other great modernists who gathered in Paris during the 1920s because no one else needs them to do for him what Gill projects them to accomplish for him. After meeting her, he says of, of uh, Zelda Fitzgerald that, quote, she is exactly as we've come to know her through books and articles that is, through the books and articles that he's read about her. All of the great expatriates of the 20s conjured up by Gill's time traveling are presented in very one-dimensional terms, as in here, young Hemingway uh, speaks exactly the way his characters do, which enchants Gill because he expects nothing else. I believe that love is true and real. I believe that, lo that love Something's wrong with that. I believe that love that is true and real creates a respite from death. All cowardice comes from not loving or not loving well, which is the same thing. Uh, I've read most of Hemingway, and I don't actually recognize that, but it's very close to ideas that he often expressed, either through characters or through himself. And Alan is simply using whatever limited knowledge Alan has of Ernest Hemingway to create a kind of type of Ernest Hemingway, who is very funny. Uh, you remember the scene in which he, he yells, who wants to fight? Um, it's, it's a kind of, of uh, type of Ernest Hemingway, but it's close enough and it's also funny that it works because it's exactly the kind of Ernest Hemingway that, um, that Gil Pender would create and he needs to create an Ernest Hemingway so that the Ernest Hemingway will encourage him to stay in France and be serious about literature and not go back and be a Hollywood hack. Um, another character that, that, um, that Gill runs into is Gertrude Stein, uh, who is not remembered at all for her generously giving of her time to read manuscripts presented to her by random American strangers. Uh, she reads Gills because he needs her commendation if he's to convince himself to break off his engagement and remain in France uh, to try to write seriously. Uh, Gertrude Stein even gives him a credo to live by. We all fear death and question our place in the universe. The artist's job is not to succumb to despair, but to find an antidote to the emptiness of existence. You have a clear and lively voice. Don't be such a defeatist. Some viewers might maintain that Alan's previous five films were, in fact, the work of a defeatist, of, of someone who had gotten tired of things and um, was making films that suggested as much. Uh, in the remainder of the film, then, Gail has to prove uh, himself to not, to not be such a defeatist. And in Midnight in Paris's loveliest speech, he proves himself to be a um, to be a measurably greater optimist than the filmmaker who created him. Quote, you know, I sometimes think, how is anybody ever going to come up with a book or a painting or a sculpture that can compete with a great city? Be excuse me, because when you look around, every street, every boulevard is its own art form. And when you think that in the cold, violent universe Paris exists, 
these lights. I mean, come on, there's nothing happening on Jupiter or Neptune, but from space you can see these lights, the cafes, people singing and drinking. I mean, for all we know, Paris is the hottest spot in the universe. To think that Woody Allen actually wrote that speech is, is rather surprising, uh, given his uh, his usual tendency to uh, to emphasize the the coldness and emptiness of the universe as opposed to the hotness of Paris, uh, the hottest spot in in the universe. So the way I'm reading the um, the way I'm reading Midnight in Paris is, is to say it's as if Woody Allen asked himself what magical intercession would it have taken to convince me to stay in Paris and write novels in 1965. Midnight in Paris and its nocturnal literary and artistic lights is his answer. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Zelda, Gertrude Stein, um, and, and certainly the, the wonderful Salvador Dali with his obsession with rhinoceros. Each of the characters in Gill's Midnight Phantasmagoria plays a role in pushing him toward being a braver soul than Alan at least construes himself as being, and therefore remaining in Paris to write seriously. Adriana is necessary because she deflects Gill from his commitment to Inez, persuading him of the French insight that a man can love two women at once. One of the film's funniest scenes has Gill finding out that Adriana loves him by one afternoon reading her memoirs written 90 years before, which he buys in a dog-eared copy from a used book dealer. If you haven't seen the movie, that wouldn't make any sense to you. But basically, in the afternoon, he's existing in 2010. And in the evenings, he's existing in, in the 1920s. So in the afternoon, he can buy a copy of her memoirs, which suggest that she was in love with him. It's hard to explain. Um, that, that, that she was in love with him in the 1920s, and he can read that in 2010 because he got a dog-eared copy of her, uh, of her memoirs. Unable to admit to himself his suspicion that Inez is too interested in Paul, the pedantic fellow who keeps talking about wine and paintings in pedantic ways, Gill has Gertrude Stein confront him with it by Hemingway's autobiogra autobiographical reading of Gill's novel. Hemingway, Stein tells Gill, doesn't quite believe that the protagonist doesn't know that his fiancée is having an affair right under his eyes with the pedantic one. This is Gill telling himself something that he should already know, but is in denial about. Gill's Paris after midnight uh, turns out to be just as efficacious as the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future in A Christmas Carol are in altering the course of Scrooge's life. Gill breaks off his engagement, telling Inez that her parents uh, and her parents that he's not returning to California. And that night, he re-encounters a Parisian young woman, Gabrielle, who loves Cole Porter and who gives Gil another motivation for staying in Paris as they walk beautifully off into the rain of the Paris midnight. Midnight in Paris is a lovely comic fantasy of what it might have taken to keep a very young Woody Allen in Paris all those years ago. We might stop for, for questions now if anybody has them um, about Midnight in Paris. If not, then we can go on to, to Rome with Love. OK, so if anyone has a question, uh, again, you may need, need to maximize the pane. And at the bottom um, of the navigation pane, you should see a hand that you can click on to virtually raise your hand. So we'll just look through the list of attendees. Uh, it looks like uh, Ed Forbes um, may have a comment or question. Ed, I'm going to go ahead and un unmute you and go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. Hey, Kim. Thanks uh, for taking my question. I just wanted to thank Dr. Bailey for, um, for the lecture. And um, just wondered, Dr. Bailey, if you had any sense if, if, um, if Alan in any of his writings had his own sort of projections of Paris during that visit in 65. In, uh, uh, no, because, um, well, well, let's see, wait a minute. He, he did shoot scenes from Everyone Says I Love You in Paris. That was the first time after what's 
new pussycat that he had gone there since obviously was shooting everything in New York. Um, but but he's written almost nothing about himself, which isn't in interviews. So you know the the, the reason that everybody writes about Woody Allen ends up writing uh, writing in writing a, quoting interviews is there's really nowhere else to go. He just doesn't he doesn't do that. I mean, as you know, he writes he writes for the New Yorker. He writes he uh, he writes funny stuff for them, but. He hasn't written autobiographically. There's no memoir, and so right. there's not much to to go on except those interviews. I also wondered, Dr. Bailey, if you had any um, insight as to why he chose um, the Sidney Bechet tune and, as the opening sequence, "Si Tu Vois Ma Mère," uh, which is really, really lovely. I think he's always loved Sidney Bechet. Um, why that song? Actually, the, the collections of Bechet I have don't have that song on it, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure where he was getting that. Uh, do you know anything about that particular track? I don't know. I, I do have it in my musical collection, so I'll, I'll take a look at it and, and see if I okay. have it, and I'll let you know. Yeah, it, it certainly I, I think you would admit it seems awfully perfect at the beginning of that film to go through that montage with, with Sidney Bechet as the, as the soundtrack. Right. Yeah. That seems right. awfully stunning to me. I just, I just like watching the beginning of it, and then I might watch it again, and maybe I'll say, no, that was enough. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like, that's the same for me. It's sort of like the opening sequence in Manhattan. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Very similar to it. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, thanks for calling in and, and listening. Ed, good to hear from you. Thank you, back Peter. Take care. So long. Okay, we'll look and see if anyone else has a comment or a question. Looking through the list. Again, raise your hand if you had a comment or a question. Uh, no one else at this time looks like they have a comment or question. Oh, I think maybe one just went up. Yes, it looks like Rosanna uh, Longenbaker, uh, if I pronounced that correctly, Rosanna, did you have a comment or a question? Rosanna? Hello? Hi there. Did you have a comment or a question? Well, I was just wondering, thinking as we were kind of discussing through this, is it possible in this film that maybe all of it was in... Um, Gil's mind because I, I know I rewatched the movie last night and I, I've always thought of it as being sort of just a, a magical thing where he goes away into this car from the 1920s and now I'm wondering maybe it could all be um, not real or else open to the viewer's interpretation where it, it could be real or not real it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean my argument is, is exactly what you said that the whole not the whole movie, because there are a couple of scenes which are not from Gill's point of view. But um, really, most of the film is a projection of things going on in his mind because he needs Ernest Hemingway, he needs F. Scott Fitzgerald, he needs uh, Gertrude Stein to command his literary efforts to give him the confidence to stay there and write seriously. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. The film doesn't make any sense otherwise to me. I think you're precisely right that it's all a projection of what his psychological needs are, and it's and it's presented beautifully without ever giving away that that's what's going on. That it's kind of the dream life of Walter Mitty, or or Scrooge with his. Nobody, you know, nobody else sees the, sees the three ghosts. It's all Scrooge, and that's all we care about, because Scrooge is the one who has to change his life. Great. Thanks, Rosanna. Okay. That looks like all for you. Okay. So we go, uh, we go on to, um, to Rome with Love. I, uh, 
personally, I'm I'm a lot less enthusiastic about about this one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just look at at one section of it. But but for those of you who haven't seen it, I'll give a brief plot summary of the parts that that I'm not paying too much attention to. Uh, to Roam with Love is the sort of un ensemble film Alan favors when he has a number of ideas to play with, but no clear dramatic or thematic purpose uniting them all. If you saw the early film, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, that's an example. Or Everyone Says I Love You is, is another one. Uh, he likes ensemble films. I mean, obviously, the, the uh, the DVD cases always show all the faces of the people in his movies because that's how he's making them. This is very much an ensemble film. Alec Baldwin commented that the film is an homage to the Italian cinema of Bertolucci and Fellini. At points, it seems to resemble films of those directors less than it does the random comedics of divorce Italian style. The movie's characters often comment on the beauties of the Roman places they are passing through. But perhaps because Alan had no similar personal link to Rome, that, that he, this uh, same personal link that he had to Paris, to Rome with love seems, as a number of reviewers commented, touristy. Uh, these are these are the four plots that these are the three plots that I'm not going to talk about too much. Jerry, played by Woody Allen and Phyllis Judy Davis, are traveling there to visit their daughter Haley, Allison Pill. Jerry, a retired record producer, gets interested in Haley's fiance father, who sings great opera, but only in the shower. And if you've seen the movie, you know that there's a long passage where he's singing in the shower in the great opera halls of of, uh, of Italy. Uh, another plot is a newly married couple, Antonio and Neely, arrive in Rome from uh, their home in the Italian countryside to meet with Antonio's wealthy relatives. But Neely gets lost in search of a hairdresser, and Antonio has to pretend that Anna Penel uh, Penelope Cruz, a peripatetic sex toy of, of a prostitute, is actually his wife. And you can imagine the complications that get involved there. Uh, quite a, a funny episode. Leopoldo Pisanello, uh, played by Robert Roberto Benini, uh, Life is Beautiful, you might recall. He was the uh, star of that. Uh, Leopoldo Pisanello is a clerk who is suddenly and inexplicably made into a celebrity by the Italian media before they equally irrationally divest him of his fame by ignoring him and choosing some other Italian nobody to celebrate instead. It seems as if that scene could be, it, it could be a scene out of, of Alan's film Celebrity, or it could be set in the United States as we go through you know, six celebrities a day and then tomorrow there's six new ones. Um, the joke is obvious. It's well, it's well handled with, with Benini being quite funny in that role. And then finally, Jack and Sally, young Americans living in Rome, welcome Sally's friend Monica for a visit and all his protestations to the contrary notwithstanding, Jack falls passionately in love with their house guest. It's uh, to, left to John Foy, Alec Baldwin. Uh, I'm sorry, it's to John Foy, Alec Baldwin, that Jack Jesse Eisenberg insists that Monica will pose no threat to his relationship with Sally. And because the more comedic episodes of To Run With Love offer little food for thought, I'll concentrate on the Jack John Foy relationship instead. Then if people want to talk about those other scenes, that's fine. Jack encounters Foy in his, uh, in his Roman neighborhood, and their conversation reveals that Foy is already the architect that young Jack is working to become, and that Foy lived in the same neighborhood when he was Jack's age. Now, here's a, here's a term that will bring you back to English 102. They are split protagonists. They uh, alter egos. Jack is young, passionate, and eager. John Foy is older, skeptical, and unbelieving. And the the, the dialectic between them is is what the uh, is what this episode is all about. From Play It Again, Sam onward, Alan has enjoyed creating characters who appear to the protagonist as an invisible guide mentor, and this is clearly what Foy is. 
Sometimes uh, the other characters in the episode acknowledge his presence in scenes. At other times, only Jack seems to know he's there. If you remember, uh, play it again, Sam, Bogart, the, the, the spirit of Bogart, the something of Bogart, vaporizes by Alan Felix's side to tutor him in Bogartian methods of seduction. Um, John Foy is very similar to that. He serves Jack as a sort of a rhetorical chastity belt, discouraging and deriding his adulterous, erotic impulses. So you've got the young man who's, who's fallen in love with somebody he shouldn't have fallen in love with, and you've got the older, tireder uh, man saying, this is not going to work well for you. Um, as a screenwriter director of largely domestic comedy dramas, Alan has repeatedly invoked the varieties uh, of erotic experience. Everyone says, I love you. Everyone falls out of love. Everyone falls back into love again over and over and over again. Oh, uh, OK. Um, once both Jack and uh, John Foy have met Monica upon her arrival, Foy anticipates the outcome of Jack's interactions with her telling Jack and, in effect, the audience, yes, she does have a certain something which trumps logic. So go ahead, walk into the propeller. Um, in, in Husbands and Wives, nobody put that as, as one of their favorite Allen films. Uh, in Husbands and Wives, um, the Woody Allen character says something, of, uh, uh, talks about being attracted to kamikaze women. Kamikaze women are the uh, kind of women who fly their plane into you. And obviously, uh, Monica Foy thinks is one such female. And surprise, he turns out to be right. Um, one, of the, one of the things that this film, um, and, and many of his films, uh, kind of support is this quotation from uh, Love and Death, which was another film on my list of 15, but it didn't make the final five, uh, in which we have this wonderful conversation about love. To love is to suffer. To avoid suffering, one must not love. But then one suffers from not loving. Therefore, to love is to suffer. Not to love is to suffer. To suffer is to suffer. To be happy is to love. To be happy, then, is to suffer. But suffering makes one unhappy. Therefore, to be happy, one must love or love to suffer or suffer from too much happiness. <laughs> um, this, this would be close to what uh, John Foy thinks love is, because John Foy is is Alec Baldwin, and you know the kinds of roles that, that Alec Baldwin plays in which he's the skeptic, in which he's the cynic, in which he's uh, the guy who says, what, what did you think you were doing, and why did you think you were doing it? To, um, to uh, Jesse, uh, Jesse Eisenberg, I wish I knew other films Jesse Eisenberg had been in, but I don't. Um, he's quite good in this. Uh, when Monica begins invoking for Jack authors she considers soulful, Foy warns him, first it's Camus, then it's Kierkegaard. Mock adopting uh, Monica's point of view, he adds, now that I've run out of name dropping, let's break into somewhere. Soon she'll have you holding up filling stations. Uh, you might think about those. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of, of the movie in which the uh, a couple get together and start holding up filling stations because it's exciting because uh, because it, it gets your gets your dander up and and that's what he's suggesting that she will want to do uh, so they do uh, in in fulfillment of what uh, of what Don Foy says. They break into the old human ba uh, Roman baths during a rainstorm, and Monica fuses, I think Rome is so romantic. Foy starts to object, but Jack barks, will you keep out of this scene and give me a moment alone with her? Foy replies, OK, but remember, I know how it comes out. It's almost as if Foy is a character outside the plot who occasionally bops in to tell, uh, to tell young Jack what's going to happen and then bops out again. 
whereas the rest of To Rome With Love is comedic, realistic, the Jack John plot is highly self-conscious, with John stepping outside the narrative and predicting how it comes out. Jack and Monica agree to tell Sally, Sally his, uh, his current lover, of their desperate love for one another, and they plan to leave Rome to see all the architectural wonders of Italy together. Before they can tell Sally, however, Monica's agent in Hollywood calls to say she has landed a role in a, in a blockbuster. If you think back to what Hollywood represented in Midnight in Paris, it represents exactly same thing. In uh, To Rome With Love, Monica is a sellout and she's selling out big time. Monica is as passionate about the director and role as she was about Jack and Italian architecture five minutes earlier, and so Sally never learns how close she came to losing Jack to her seductive friend. Consider yourself lucky is John Foy's summation of the affair, Monica. You saved your own life there. A year from now, you'd have her, she'd have you free fall, you'd have her, she'd have you free fall parachuting and adopting Burmese orphans. And I wonder if anyone, anyone would like to suggest why he, uh, he included, she'd have you free fall parachuting and adopting Burmese orphans. Okay, let's see if anyone has a comment or reaction to that. Um, again, go ahead and raise your hand if you do. Any comments or questions related to that? Okay, we have a quiet group tonight. All right. All right. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's not bad to be the professor who's the only one who knows the answers. So <laughs> I'm not, uh, that's not problematical. If you think back to the relationship between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow, one of the things that they had trouble with was the fact that Mia Farrow was constantly going abroad and uh, adopting children. And so this is... 20 years later, you would think that he might have gotten over it by now, but apparently not. 20 years later, he's still taking a slap at Mia Farrow, suggesting that in some ways she's like Monica. And I suspect, I have no idea, that it would be interesting to know whether she ever goes to see one of his movies. I think not. I'm pretty sure she wouldn't. But uh, probably somebody would have told her that... that um, that he was using that line and that, um, that that was aimed very much at her. Uh, Jack's response to John having anticipated the outcome, with age comes wisdom, John, uh, with age comes wisdom, uh, he says, John replies, with age comes exhaustion. Neither construal of age is much of an aphrodisiac and amidst the happy recoupling of the young Antonio and Mili and coupling of Haley and Michelangelo resonates the Bronx cheer of John Foy that says love is only self-delusion, one very much facilitated by the duplicitous beauties of Rome. Does anybody want to ask questions, say anything about to roam with love, maybe somebody loves it more than I do. Okay. Any comments about to roam with love? Again, if you maximize your pain and look for that hand icon, you can raise your hand and we'll see that and, and call on you. Woody Allen certainly knows about maximizing your pain, so that would be good. <laughs> okay, this is the, th I, I don't even know if this is, has been on HBO or on any of the, the, the channels that run his films constantly. I don't know if that one has been, uh, has been circulated that way, so it may be that I'm the only one who has seen it and therefore I was talking to myself. You should see it. It's, 
It's it's got every Woody Allen film has great moments. I don't think there's yeah, small time crooks doesn't have any, so don't bother with that one. But the rest of them are. Uh, He's, he's always worth watching, and he's always got great cinematographers, and he's always got, you know, I mean, if, if you look at that scene, what this is, by the way, is that's Alec Baldwin sitting behind um, uh, Monica and Jack, and basically telling Jack what he should do and what he shouldn't do, and Jack is, doesn't want to hear it because he wants to, he wants to have the relationship with him. Uh, with Monica. Okay, so I guess we go on to uh, Blue Jasmine. Uh, this film is still in, in some theaters, and as I said, is, is doing quite well for a Woody Allen film in, in, in terms of finances and in terms of audience. I um, wanted to start with a quotation uh, from IMDb which describes, is the writer's attempt to describe the plot. Uh, Jasmine French uh, used to be on the top of the heap as a New York socialite, but now she is returning to her estranged sister in San Francisco, utterly ruined. As Jasmine struggles with her haunting memories of a privileged past bearing dark realities she ignored, she tries to recover in her present. Unfortunately, it all proves a losing battle as Jasmine's narcissistic hang-ups and their consequences begin to overwhelm her. In doing so, her old pretensions and new deceits begin to foul up everyone's lives, especially her own." End quote. Uh, I couldn't agree with that less. Um, Annie Hall, Hannah and her sisters, another woman, Alice. Woody Allen is clearly interested in writing and directing films about women. As many feminist, feminist critics have argued, his interest doesn't always translate into insight. It's often the case that Allen is able to project compelling dramatic renderings of women without illuminating their psychological dynamics or the external circumstances that mold them. Blue Jasmine, I'll argue here, is an exception because it consistently points up the sources of Jasmine's existential defeat. Kenneth Chisholm's IMDb description of the film ascribes Jasmine's sufferings to her and to her narcissistic hang-ups, but the film very deliberately suggests that the woman completely untouched by feminism is the victim of a thoroughly dominant force in her environment, and that force is men. Um, I think we, yeah, we move on to the... Um, Jasmine meets Hal French on the vineyard. Here we are with Alec Baldwin again, playing a not very sympathetic character. Um, Jasmine meets Hal, Hal French on the vineyard where he swept me off my feet. They dance to Jerome Kern's Blue Moon, the song that becomes Jasmine's objective correlative for their romance. There's another English department word, sorry, term. Uh, her melodic, symbolic validation of the rightness of their union. At his recommendation or insistence, she abandons her anthropology studies at Boston University to be his full-time wife, thereby ensuring her utter financial and emotional dependency upon Hal. He even changes her name from Jeanette to J Jasmine, excuse me, to validate his power of dictating her existence. She makes a point of not understanding his business dealing since, as Ginger, her adopted sister, explains, quote, when Jasmine doesn't want to know, she looks the other way. Once those, uh, end quote, once those Mad Madoffian, if that's a word, Madoff, uh, Madoff-like ma machinations have started attracting attention from the law, Hal is, is pretty much based on, on uh, Bernard Madoff. Hal dismisses her anxieties by asking, is there anything you want that you don't have? And there's the, I think that's exactly what he's asking her in the scene that you're seeing. And he then buys her a diamond bracelet for her birthday to quell her words. Doesn't exactly answer the questions, but makes her happy. At the party she and Hal Get, uh, at the party she and Hal give, uh, at which she shows off her bracelet, Hal is unbeknownst to Jasmine, conducting an affair with one of the guests, Jasmine's best friend. 
Denial won't protect her forever, of course, and the friend finally lists for her house mistresses, Jasmine's best friend, his trainer, his lawyer, and an au pair girl with whom he is recently connected. She confronts Hal finally with this list, and he dismisses as insignificant all but the au pair girl with whom he has fallen in love and whom he plans to marry once he is dispensed with Jasmine via divorce. As you can see, Alec Baldwin is, is playing according to type. Livid at the fact that she is being replaced by a teenager, as she might be, Jasmine undertakes the single conclusive, decisive, and self-destructive action for which she is responsible in the film. She turns Hal in to the FBI. The call, which she claims to regret the moment she hangs up the phone, turns out to be the poorest imaginable revenge because Hal's assets are seized and he responds to his arrest by hanging himself in prison, canceling any and all responsibility to her. To me, the likelihood that that guy would commit suicide in prison is small, but okay. The court settlement leaves Jasmine with nothing but some clothes and Henri, uh, Henri Vuitton suitcases. These she packs with what she retains and homeless. She flies to San Francisco to move in with her sister, Ginger. Although Hal is largely responsible for leaving Jasmine with no money, no prospects, and no capabilities, he's far from the only male in the film who worsens Jasmine's, Jasmine's circumstances, leaving her on a San Francisco park bench with nowhere to go. So the argument I'm making basically is, is it's not just about her narcissism and snobbishness. It's also about the way men treat her throughout the film, which leave her where she ends up. Chili, Ginger's lover, makes it very clear to Jasmine that he's waiting to move in with Ginger and that Jasmine's stay is, that all that's, is all that stands in his way. She's not very nice to him either. Uh, she makes it clear that Chili is unworthy of Ginger, that he's a loser and a barometer of Ginger's lowly estimation of herself. So they have reason to dislike each other. And, and if you've read any reviews, you've seen a lot of people comparing this to a streetcar named Desire with uh, Chili playing the Stanley Kowalski role and um, uh, Blanche being, uh, Blanche being played by uh, Kate Blanchett. In order to make money to support her com computer classes, Jasmine accepts the job uh, she considers menial as a receptionist in a dentist office. Dr. Flicker, the dentist, soon becomes attracted to her, and his sexual assault upon her sends her fleeing from the office and quitting the job and thereby losing its income. Another male who's uh, turning upon her is, is complicit in her fall, if she was ever in grace, at the end of the film. She meets a wealthy diplomat with political ambitions named Dwight Franklin, whose proposal of marriage seems to her the answer to all of her problems. When they're entering a jeweler so that she can choose her engagement ring, Ginger's ex-husband, Augie, appears Still enraged at the money he lost to one of Hal's investment schemes, Augie lets Jasmine have it, inadvertently pointing up to Dwight the falsities of the story of her past with which Jasmine has presented it. Convinced that a wife with all of Jasmine's baggage couldn't help his political career, Dwight calls off the engagement, abandoning her to find her way on the outskirts of San Francisco. During his tirade, here's another man who's responsible for where she ends up. Uh, Augie also tells her that Danny, Hal's son from a first marriage, is in Oakland. Seeking a commiserating soul, she locates Danny in Oakland, only to learn that he is angrier, angrier at her for turning Hal in than he is angry at Hal for being a cheat and a hypocrite. He tells her to leave him alone that he has moved on, and that she should, too. She returns to Ginger's apartment, where Chili, acting on the supposition that Jasmine would marry Dwight and be gone, has moved in. He and Ginger celebrate their reconciliation while Jasmine takes a shower, telling herself, oh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to, this, uh, to this still. Um, 
anxiety, nightmares, and nervous breakdown. There's only so many traumas a person can withstand before they take to the streets and start screaming. Uh, in a way, that's her take, and it's a little bit like what Chisholm says, but I don't think she's seeing the extent to which men have placed her in the position that she's in. Uh, even a male Jasmine has never even met unknowingly contributes to her desperate plight at the film's close. Al, a Sonics pro that Ginger meets at the party where Jasmine meets Dwight, has a passionate fling with Ginger, but his wife finds out about it and he calls it off. As long as Al remains in the picture for Ginger, Jasmine has a, has a place to stay. His departure opens the way for Chile to displace Jasmine, who now, at the film's end, has nowhere to live and nothing to live on. We leave her sitting on a bench somewhere in San Francisco, realizing that she can no longer recall the lyrics to Blue Moon, i.e., she can no longer piece together the musical validation of hers and Hal's marriage. And then if we can go back to those two. OK. Um, what I'm seeing in this scene is the fact that the men, and that's Ginger's sister uh, with, with Chili's arm over him, very happy, very at ease, feeling like they're uh, very much in control of the situation. And if, uh, and if you look at Jasmine looking off into the distance, looking uncomfortable, looking like this is nowhere that she wants to be, and obviously it is not anywhere that she wants to be. She doesn't want to date Eddie, uh, the, the smallish man next to her who wants to date her. This has been a terrible day for her, but for the two men and for Ginger, this is fine. They're laughing. They're having a grand old time. And then this, if, if you've taken any film courses, you know how to read this. Where are the women and where are the men? It's very obvious that this is shot in order to suggest the power relationships, the domination of men over women, because they're seated and uh, the men are standing up. You get that throughout this movie. Uh, feminists, as I've suggested, are not they tend not to be fans of Woody Allen, but I think if they paid a little bit more attention to this one, it really is all about um, it really is all about Jasmine being placed in the position she's placed in at the end of the movie because of the way men generally treat her, and that's a pretty good image of, of what's the what are the male female dynamics? That's it. You got it. Yeah. Admittedly, Jam Jasmine is complicit in her circumstance as a result of falsifying her past and holding on to a snobbishness her current position no longer justifies. But it's largely the actions of men in her life that have brought her down to her film concluding desperation. And that's my reading. Uh, it's, it's, it's a reading based on, on watching the movie in, in theaters about five times, so it's a little shakier than the others because I wasn't able to write down the dialogue and so forth, but um, that's my reading of, uh, of Blue Jasmine. Great. Do we want to take some comments or questions? Yeah, if anybody has people any? have them. Okay, again, if anyone has any thoughts or questions about this particular film, please go ahead and raise your hand. Or about the whole thing, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, it looks like Timothy Coleman um, has a comment or question. Go ahead. Timothy, did you have a comment or a question? Okay, uh, perhaps not. Let's see. Anyone else with a comment or question about anything we've discussed to date? I guess one of the things I'd add, well, you're contemplating questions or not questions. Um, 
if you think about the three films that that uh, that I've discussed tonight, these are very different films made by the same director working with basically the, the, the same the same company, the same producers, his sister is one of his his producers. The the model comes from Ing Ingmar Bergman's uh, production company and Ingmar Bergman was turning out about a film a year and that's what that's what Woody Allen committed himself to. And some people would say, well, you know, Woody, if you uh, if you spent more time on, you know, two or three of these, maybe they'd be better films. And he said, no, I want to do a film a year. If they're good, they're good. If they're not good, they're not good. It doesn't matter how much time I spent on them. What matters is that they're um, they're, they're, I, I made them. People say what they want about them. If they like them, it's good. If they don't like them, nobody's dead. Um, and therefore, he goes on to the next one. And he's already on to the film, which I think is called Moon at Midnight. And uh, as usual, we know nothing about the plot because he won't give out the plot. One of the interesting, for those of you who saw um, uh, Blue Jasmine, only two actors had the entire script, uh, um, Blanchett and Hawkins, who plays Ginger. They had the entire script. The other actors had only their part. And he loves to do that. He loves to make the uh, uh, some of the actors not know where anything is coming from, and therefore they, he thinks, give a better uh, performance if they're a little bit in the dark. And, and so only Blanchett and Hawkins had the whole script. Okay, I, I went ahead and also turned on the ability to type in questions because it, it sounds like we've got a kind of quiet group there tonight. So if you're more comfortable typing in a question um, rather than raising your hand and, um, and actually posing your question to the group, um, you can now do that by going to the question portion of your pane and actually typing um, something in there. Um, so I'm looking here. Uh, it looks like Tim Timothy Coleman, Timothy Coleman is, is just saying hi to, to Dr. Bailey. Um, any any specific question or comment that you have, um, Tim? Okay. It looks like we have a um, a comment here. Um, from Judith uh, Faircloth saying that uh, she actually thinks that Jasmine's circumstances are of her own making. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically the the argument of, of the uh, IMD reviewer. Uh, certainly, certainly there are things she does. Um, turning her husband in to the FBI turns out to be a bad move for both him and her. Um, and she is, she's wonderfully unattractive in her snobbishness towards Chile, in her snobbishness towards uh, Eddie, or general snobbishness. She never gets rid of it. Um, yes, you can, you can make that argument. I, I, like, I like the argument that, that men are in there too, being part of it, but, but sure. Okay, and we've got a comment or a question from Virginia Manuel who's saying, even though it wasn't part of tonight's discussion, I would love to hear what you thought of Match Point, which I consider one of his best. Um, yeah, yes, uh, I, that was on the list of 15, certainly. That, and again, these are these are just these are just mine. Uh, I, I would certainly put that among some of his best films. Uh, the, 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 na the thing that nags me a little bit about that movie is at the end, 
I don't know about the ghost coming and, and saying, why am I collateral damage? And, and uh, he's kind of signaling this, this, this stuff from, um, uh, from crime and punishment. The protagonist is reading crime and punishment at some point, and then the protagonist goes into that thing at the end about the best thing is never to be born. And, and yeah, those are, those are ideas that, that certainly Woody Allen has. I've not seen much evidence throughout the film that that character has them. So to, to go there at the end of the film surprised me a little. And, and when I see it now, it, it kind of bothers me. But, but that's it. I mean, otherwise, it's beautifully shot. England is, is stunning. And, um, you know, it could, could there possibly be a more wonderful evocation of rich people in London than that movie. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it, it really is stunning. And the fact that he made it, and you know, you know that, that what many people said about it is, it's wonderful. It's nothing like a Woody Allen movie. Well, okay, it really is nothing like a Woody Allen movie. And by the way, a lot of people have said that about Blue Jasmine, too, that there is no Woody Allen character in Blue Jasmine, and thank God. It looks like we have a question from Judy Gibson. Judy, did you want to go ahead and ask your question aloud? Go ahead, Judy. Uh, Judy, if you can hear us, you can go ahead and make your comment or question. Okay, it looks like we're having not able to hear Judy's, um, Judy's comment. Any other questions or comments? It looks like we may have another question here. Let me just... Judy had wonderful things down. to say in the Woody Allen class, so she should <laughs> come forth. Uh, let's see. It says, uh, we've got Tim Coleman, Mary Beth Fortin, and Sam Kindred from 30 years ago. We're thrilled to hear your voice, and we're interested if you thought that Woody Allen would be remembered as a great writer or as someone who used art as a release for his anxieties or both. Also, who would you liken him to in the literary arena? And then lastly, we appear to be muted, but we'll pause with the computer. So. <laughs> um. Yeah, can we, can we go back to the... The first part of that question. So if you thought Woody Allen would be remembered as a great writer or as someone who used art as a release for his anxieties or both? Both. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no question. One of the reasons he makes these films, and he's been very forthright about this, he makes the films because he wants to live in these realities. He doesn't want to live where he lives. He doesn't want to live in everyday usual reality. He makes the films for the reason that he gets to live in Paris in the 1920s or he gets to live in, in uh, San Francisco in the, in the 2010s. Yeah, that's why, he, that's why he makes the movies and, you know, uh, he, he makes the movies so he doesn't have to think about death. That's the other reason. Um, and it looks, the other part of the question is, and who would you liken him to in the literary arena? Well, I've written books about both Woody Allen and uh, and John Updike. Given given their track records, he and Philip Roth, those three, year in, year out. Let's let's think the depressing thought just for a minute. Forty five years. What did we do? once every year for 45 years. He not only wrote, but directed a film in every one of those years, and some of them are stunning films. So uh, I would say that I would say, I mean, obviously Updike and Roth are writers. They don't, they don't direct anything. But eh, Joyce Carol Oates, the same kind of ability. Uh, Alan once said, uh, "Some some people uh, some people have it, some don't. I have lots of it, and he has lots of it. Forty five films in forty five years. That's astonishing, and most of them are good." <laughs> it looks like we have a question um, from Lisa Lydum, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. She says, "Do you think the scene in which Jasmine confronts her husband 
about cheating um, is similar to Mia Farrow confronting Woody about Sunni. <laughs> yes, I would think so, and I don't think Woody Allen would, because Woody Allen probably does not want to think about uh, about that and about the photographs and about um, you know, uh, talking about moving on. Uh, if you try to ask him a question that has anything to do with any of that, not a chance. He's not going to talk about it. Uh, not interested. Uh, what was the NPR program that he was on last year? That uh, a, a woman does the, the very sharp woman. Damn, not going to think of her name, but um, she she asked the questions, and there would just be these silences, and he was just not responding. You know, there were certain questions. I'll be on your radio show. I'll ask some questions, but if I don't like them, nope. So, yeah, um, uh, you hardly ever see pictures of him with Soon Yi. He's trying to keep her out of the limelight completely, has done it, ex except for a movie called um, uh, Wild Man Blues. She just doesn't exist in public, and that's the way he likes it. Looks like we have another uh comment and question from Tim, Timothy Coleman. It said, I have trouble finding humor in writing, and you gave me the Dick Gibson show. Uh, <laughs> do you find great humor in Woody Allen? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, where did he start? He started as a comedian in, in, uh, in Annie Hall. He does one of Woody Allen's stand-ups as if it was Sandy Bates. Not Sandy Bates, but, but uh, it was the, the protagonist. Routine, yeah. Um, he's actually the the last film in which he played a major role, which means you know wisecracking Woody Allen role was a scoop, and he and he indicated after that 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 would be his last. He did. He does appear in um, in To Rome with Love, but it really does seem as if. The jokes have gotten tired, and he's tired of playing that role. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him in um, in another film, because as he's admitted, the, the jokes the jokes are just getting harder to come by. And uh, boy, there's some bad ones in To Rome with Love. You just you just wish there were an editor there who says, Woody, not not that one, not that one. Okay, perfect. All right, Any, anything else in closing? Okay, I thank you for listening. It's, it's been a pleasure to, uh, I have not had the chance to, to talk about these three movies in any other way, so, so this got me started thinking about them, and, uh, and I hope it has been pleasure of you, uh, pleasurable for you to, to think about them too with me. Thank you very much for uh, being on the line, and especially those of you who took classes with me. My goodness, you still out there, and I hope doing very well. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, and, and a special thank you uh, to Dr. Bailey for um, leading tonight's lecture. Thank you um, so much. Um, immediately after the webinar um, tonight, you all will receive a link to a very brief survey. I would ask that you take a moment to answer the questions, as your feedback will help us shape future lectures. We are hoping, um, moving forward, to plan a lecture a month um, is our goal at this point, and we'd love to have you uh, join us um, for future lectures. So thank you so much, and have a great night. Thanks, everyone.